according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, for they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil, and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. We need a grant. That was my line to the council as we were discussing this past week how we were going to get some important information across to the congregation. We need a picture. We can't just put some words in a bulletin, we can't just have a temple talk, and if we put something in a spreadsheet, people's eyes just glaze over like, oh, like that. We need to have a picture of what we're talking about. We need a visual people can use to see themselves as part of the whole thing, and we need an image that people can imagine themselves to be part of. Pictures are important like that, and I think that's why Jesus so often taught using parables. Because parables are, in a sense, a picture. They are word pictures. They're an image of a complex thing, but shown in a way that people can see and understand and visualize themselves to be a part of. So in today's Gospel reading, Jesus begins by teaching the crowds and telling them things, many things, he says, in parables. He teaches them in word pictures. And the first image he uses is a common picture that people would have been familiar with in his time and place. A guy who is a sower, somebody who plants seed in sowing by basically re reaching into the bag and just scattering it like this. It's not a very careful thing. But this guy just goes out and he sows. And as he sows, some seed falls on the path, because he's not very careful, and some seed falls in the rocks, some seed falls among the thorns, and some seed, thankfully, falls on good soil. It's an easy picture to visualize, and yet, even some of Jesus' disciples don't get what the picture is all about. So Jesus explains it to them in the second part of today's Gospel reading. The seed, he says, is the Word of God, and it's so powerful that it can yield a hundredfold, sixty, or thirtyfold, which is unfathomable in a day in which seven to tenfold was considered average. It's hugely important. It's, it's, it's amazingly powerful. And people, Jesus says, are like the soil. So some folks are like the path. They feel so walked on, so trampled in their lives, that God's word barely has a chance to grab hold and take root. Some folks are like rocky ground. They hear God's word and they think it's great, but there are a lot of other things that are great too, and God's word just doesn't seem that important right now, and they sort of get distracted, and they don't do much work. <coughs> Some folks, Jesus says, are like thorny ground. They care deeply about all kinds of important stuff, including political oppression, and whether or not they've got enough money for their families. God's word may be important, but it's not really mission critical right now. And then Jesus says, some people are like good soil. They actually invest in the relationship with the seed. And ironically, the fruit that gets produced is precisely what they need in order to deal with the rocks and the thorns and the birds. 
Jesus explains the picture. But here's the real problem with this or any picture. It doesn't neatly explain everything. There are still lots of questions to ponder. Most importantly in this parable is this question, who tends the soil? Who's supposed to be in charge of taking care of what's going on with the soil? God, in this parable, in this picture, is the person who sows the seed. We are the soil. But who clears out the rocks? Who cuts away the thorns? Who blocks off places which have become paths where paths should not be? Who takes the good soil? Who's supposed to be doing all of that stuff? After all, if you are like me, you probably have had times in your life where you have felt like all four kinds of this soil. Maybe you feel like two or three of them at the same time. I know that I have been in that position also. And sometimes I just wonder, are we just like the dirt? Are we just like the soil? Are we helpless victims of our own circumstances? And like dirt, are we, you know, are we dumb as dirt? We don't even know what kind of, I don't know whether, the dirt doesn't know whether it's the path or rocky soil or, or thorny soil or good soil. It's just dirt, it just lays there and there's nothing the soil can do about it. Is that really what Jesus is saying here? And of course, we can't always control a lot of the things that go on in our lives that make us the kind of soil that we are. Thorns spring up in our lives in ways that we do not expect and cannot control. Rocks and birds just seem to appear out of nowhere, and in spite of how hard we try, we just get trampled on, and we feel like a path. And yet, the last part of this parable, the last piece of Jesus' parable itself, is interesting. Jesus says, let anyone with ears listen. That is Jesus' standard way of saying, hey, watch this. Pay attention. Now, if in fact all that Jesus was trying to say is you are helpless victims of whatever is going on in your life, you are just the way you are, there is nothing you can do about it, all he would have to say is, hey, this is the way it is, suck it up, deal with it. It is the way it is. But that's not what he says. He says, pay attention, watch, think about this. And I think he's doing that because in some respects, Jesus is calling us to pay attention and listen because he says that we are not just passive soil, that we are not just people who are completely the victims of our own circumstances, that there are things that we are supposed to do to cultivate the soil that is us. And that's kind of the, the difficulty of a parable because sometimes if you push the analogy, you stretch the analogy too far, it breaks. And I think what Jesus is doing here is saying to us, you know, there are, there are opportunities for you to be able to, to not only be the soil, but to cultivate the soil that is you. And sometimes, taking responsibility for cultivating the kind of soil that we are means tending to the things that make us crazy and upset and confused. Sometimes soil cannot have a relationship with the seed because it's just frankly too exhausted from supporting all the thorns and all the weeds. And often, the thing that keeps us from engaging when what God is trying to plant in our lives is that we're just too exhausted to deal with it. We go, yeah, this is great, this is wonderful, but my gosh, everything else that's going on in my life that is that it's just sucking the life energy out of me and I don't have the energy for it. And I know at least sometimes in my life, part of tending the soil that I am means finding ways to take a deep breath and letting go of things that I know that I can't control. Because I know there's an awful lot of things that I cannot control in my life. I cannot control some of those weeds and some of those thorns, but I think I can. I really want to. And some of it is letting go emotionally of some of that stuff. It's not that I stop caring, but it's that I step back and I take a deep breath and I try to transcend all the craziness that's going on around me. Because sometimes when I'm able to do that, God is able to work in my life in ways that actually give me the peace and the strength and the, and the, the kind of mindset 
to be able to deal with some of that stuff. It's kind of like, you know, we, nobody ever pays attention anymore when you get on the airplane to all the stuff you're supposed to do in case of emergency. You know, like if the cabin pressure drops, they, you know, the little mask come down. At this point, please stop screaming and, you know, put the mask on yourself first. But you're supposed to put the mask on yourself first because if you're sitting there like everybody else going, ah! Not only can't you help yourself, you can't help anybody else. And sometimes tending the soil that we are is kind of like finding a way to spiritually put on the oxygen mask, to breathe deeply what God is telling us and what God is doing in our lives so that we're going to have the strength to then be able to deal with all the other stuff that's making us crazy and afraid. Sometimes that's what we need to do to tend the soil that is us. Sometimes, I think tending the soil that is us means that we tend to the things that completely distract us and just keep us too busy. Sometimes soil can't have a relationship with the seed because there are just too many rocks for the seed to be able to find anything to just kind of grab hold of and root into. And, and I know for me in my life sometimes the problem with trying to listen for what God is saying to me and doing in my life is there's just too many other things going on. And, and I, I'm, I'm so um, kind of used to now that if I've got nothing going on in my life, I'm wondering what little thing am I supposed to be doing that somebody else wants me to do? And I gotta check my newsfeed, and I gotta read my email, and I gotta do all these, I mean, I, I, I just reflexively got all this other stuff. There are so many of those rocks in my life, I don't get any space for anything else. Sometimes part of tending the soil that's us means being able to find ways to kind of shove a few of those rocks out of the way. And to be able to be in a place where we're able to sit and listen. And we're able not to be so distracted by everything else going on that if God did something right in front of my face, I would actually see it because I'm not too busy checking on everything else that's going on in my life. Part of tending the soil that's us means being able to kind of push some of the rocks away so that I'm able to deal with the rocks that I can't push away. And maybe one of the most important things about tending the soil that's us is being able to find ways to actually physically change where we are, even if just for a little bit of time. And I think this is, <clears throat> when, I, when I was thinking about this parallel, that this is, this is the hardest part of stretching the analogy. Soil can't get up and move. It's the path. It's the rocky ground. It's the thorny ground. It lies where it lies and it can't move itself, but we can. And sometimes, changing the soil that we are, tending to the soil that we are, means sometimes moving ourselves into a slightly different place. And I thought about this this week because the last few weeks I've been leading these discussions about why. You saw some of my emails that are just entitled, oh, why are we here? But why does God want us to be together? Why should we gather together? One of those major questions that I asked people was, what is it about Christian community that, that I need? What, what do I need from Christian community that I can't get any place else? And at least for me, part of the answer to that question is that when I gather with other Christians, when I'm part of Christian community, and I, I, I take myself out of everything else that I'm doing, and I gather with worship community especially, I can experience God in a way that I just cannot when I'm sitting by myself. And it doesn't matter if I'm trying to pray by myself, read the Bible by myself. When I'm gathered together with other people, when I'm physically in a different place in my life, God can speak with me and, and work in my life in ways that it just doesn't happen when I'm by myself. And for whatever thing it is in your life that, that puts you in a kind of a different physical place that helps you to experience God working and acting in your life, sometimes that's the kind of tending of the soil that needs to be done in order for you to be in a place where you can be good soil, where God's Word can take root in you and grow and bear fruit. You know, in the end, God's Word, if we want it to take root in us and to grow and bear fruit, we have to have a relationship with the seed. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the, the real image here of the seed in the soil, that, that God's Word comes to us freely and openly, and that's what Jesus is saying, and it's, and it's not based on anything we do. But if we want it to do anything, we've got to actually engage with it. We can't just sit back and say, hey God, lay it on me, and I'm not going to engage. 
It means that not only are we going to be the soil, but we've got to be people who are actively taking the responsibility of tending to the soil that is us. And so while Jesus promises us that God's word always comes to us freely and abundantly, he's also calling us to be people who tend the soil that is us, so that God's word really can take root in us and grow and bear the kind of fruit that helps us to deal with everything, everything else in the world that so often keeps us from experiencing God.